Back in April, the uh, Beaver County Chamber had a town hall on the state of manufacturing. And it was a great event. Uh, we had about 100, 120 people uh, compared to the 295 today. Uh, and we had a great panel and lineup for that. Uh, and it kind of spurred some of our thinking about what we wanted to do on this one. We had Brent Vernon from the DCED, the Governor's Action Team come down, and Katie Kleber from the Tri-County Infrastructure Group, uh, Dennis Nichols, myself. And after that meeting, Dennis said he had an idea for uh, a different event with some different speakers, some national and international speakers. And that's how we, we kind of got here today. So we're, uh, we're really excited to have uh, Chet, Sarita, and RB here, and you'll get a chance to meet and hear from them a little bit later. Um, the chamber, uh, the Beaver County Chamber, is into collaboration and partnerships. Um, we like to do that. We're all in this together as we try to revitalize the region and grow the population uh, in our southwestern Pennsylvania area. So we were very pleased that uh, Stan from Butler and Raymond from Elwood City were able to join us um, in this. So I would like to invite Stan from Butler to come up and uh, say a few words and greet people. Stan? You can hold your applause for Stan. It's okay. Yeah, I was waiting. <laughs> I normally get a standing ovation. The, the, the funny thing is um, when I contacted actually Dennis first and said we needed to do something about uh, the Marcella Shell, the cracker plant. He said, that's a wonderful idea, contact Jack. So I called Jack and I said, do you want to work with a Pollock? I'm Stan Kosciuszko. Yeah. And an Italian, Raymond Santillo. And he said, that doesn't make any difference to me. But anyway, thank you very much for attending. This is really just the beginning of a continuation of partnerships on different events that affect both of our counties and our region. So thank you for attending. Now you're clear. Thanks, Ann. And uh, Ray Santello, Ray? Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Raymond Santillo. I'm the executive director of the Elwood City Area Chamber of Commerce, and I can tell you I'm very proud to be. In Elwood City, at one time, when I was a kid in the 50s, uh, we had U.S. Steel, we had Blonox, Aetna Standard, we had them all. And guess what? Everybody walked to work. It was amazing. 5,000 employees of U.S. Steel, no parking lot. Amazing. So now, Elwood City lost all that, and we're bouncing back. We're right in the middle of Beaver, Butler, and Lawrence County. Our office is located in Lawrence County. I'm happy to speak for all three. I'm very proud of what we're doing. The Elwood City Area Chamber is strong. We have strong directors. Our executive board, uh, we have West Banco. Many of them are here today, Dan Swartz especially. We have Wampum Underground, Deb Sedano. We have Decarias on Fifth. We have Sweet Carolines and Francis Architects. They're not only generous with their time, they're generous with sponsorship, and we're proud to mention them. We have a very strong marketing team, small town, big living. We're promoting the good word, and it's working. Uh, our membership has grown from 208 members to 385, so we're proud of that. We also, in the Elwood City area, have a strong cultural team, Elwood City Community Enrichment, we're doing some great things with the public library. Uh, I'm a retired educator, and that's what got me interested in the Chamber of Commerce. I started volunteering a lot for the library, and uh, we had a nice grant from the Hoyt in Newcastle, and uh, we're doing some good things. We have a $2.1 million library on the main street, and uh, really the area is booming. We bounced back. Uh, Adams Manufacturing just to took over a, a small industrial area. Um, we have Hall Industries, the Eric Ryan Corporation, and of course, Elwood City Forge, a $3.2 billion company. So uh, we're proud of all that, and we're proud to be here today with you. I want to especially thank all of you that are members of the Elwood City Area Chamber of Commerce. Have a great day. Um, to get on with the, uh, the program, um, one of our newest uh, chamber members is uh, Fox Rothschild, and they attended that town hall back in April. Uh, and they mentioned they know a guy who knows a guy who knows Chet and Roz. 
So uh, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Mark Santo, who will um, introduce uh, Chet. Uh, Mark, in his own right, is a partner of Fox Rothschild, uh, does a lot of international merger and acquisition business, heavily involved in process technology, spends a significant amount of time in Italy, so hopefully he'll be speaking to us in English, not Italian, because I know he's fluent in that. But uh, Mark, would you come up and uh, introduce Chad for us? Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Uh, thanks, Dennis, too, for having us here. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a uh, partner in the international practice group of Fox Rothschild. Uh, Fox, uh, you may uh, know we're in Pittsburgh. We have uh, our headquarters are in Philadelphia. We have 800 lawyers, over 800, in 22 cities, uh, and we uh, provide a full range of legal services. We have a national energy practice. Uh, my partner David and I are head up the infrastructure practice, which is connected with the Shell plant. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce Chet. Uh, Chet and I have spent the majority of our careers in what's called the process automation industry. Uh, for those who don't understand what process is for, versus discrete, discrete manufacturing is like a, an auto plant where the car comes off one after one. Process automation is in manufacturing which doesn't stop 24-7. Chemicals, pharmaceuticals, cement, gas, electricity. It, it, so the, the production process is a continuous process. Uh, I had the good fortune of uh, being a general counsel of the world's uh, eighth largest aerospace group in Rome, Italy. And one of our uh, operations was a process automation division, which happened to be at the time the second largest in the world. Uh, we sold that to ABB, and that's where I met uh, Chet. Chet uh, was uh, managing the worldwide petrochemical business of Azea Brown Bavari, which you probably know is the largest engineering firm in the world. Uh, I've met many, many executive CEOs in the process industries. No, no one has the command of the market, the drivers, the players in the petrochemical business as Chet does. Chet has a remarkable career spanning many of the major companies in this area. Today he is uh, assisting a Dutch company establishing U.S. operations in the petrochemical business in Houston, Texas. Uh, Chet's professional career covers a broad range of engineering, managerial, consulting, and senior executive positions with leading automation, electrical suppliers, software products, system integrators, and process industries. He has served in executive capacities with ABB, Foxborough, which is now Schneider, ABB, and Yokogawa. Uh, today, Yokogawa is the world's fifth largest process automation group. Chet was the president and CEO of the North American Operations. And over the last year, he has been helping process and energy industries and equipment OEMs leveraging the Internet of Things technology to identify and develop new business models based on sensors and measurement connected through the Internet. Also works with applications in the cloud and data analytics to achieve digital transformation on the inside and the outside of organizations which is essential to business growth. Uh, please welcome Chet Moroz uh, to our chamber event. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Jack. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I mean, uh, being in the industry of uh, uh, process and energy industries for the last 35, 40 years, nobody would have thought that we would have come to this point of building a brand new world scale ethylene complex for five, six billion dollars in western Pennsylvania. And we owe it a, a lot of this to the fact that that entrepreneurial spirit uh, of the oil and gas industry actually created the shale and the fracking type technologies that immediately brought the feedstock uh, availability to build those kind of industries right, right here in Pennsylvania. What I'd like to talk about today really is uh, in the theme of what Jack and the other speakers are going to talk about is workforce development. But in the age of Industry 4.0, as it's sometimes called, 
or industrial IoT, IoT being the Internet of Things, and digital transformation of many companies. This is the hottest topic in every single large boardroom around the world right now, and also the topic that many people feel will create the new response to the disruption that's going on in the economies and the technology. So some of the topics I'll address here is, first of all, a little bit of background of how the Internet of Things e erupted and grew so quickly, okay, and the fact that it's known by these multiple names, but the largest effect of this technology has been in the manufacturing industries, both process manufacturing as well as manufacturing of things and discrete and factory automation. A little bit about chemical manufacturers' journey uh, into adopting this technology for the operations of primarily their assets or their plants. A few words on Shell's digital transformation strategy and how they're going to leverage this technology in this plant and all of their plants around the world. And then uh, relating that to workforce development and the necessity for educating and bringing on board many more uh, young people and talent uh, to address this part of the uh, technology world. So a little bit of uh, uh, Silicon Valley brought to you here. Okay. A key point about Industry 4.0 is really it's the fourth evolution or industrial revolution from number one, uh, really steam engines and mechanization and steam power. Number two, uh, electrification and mass production globalization. Number three, the computer and uh, eventually the internet, uh, digital manufacturing, robotics, automation process and industrial automation. And number four, really the convergence of all of the communications Com computing and networking technology to create opportunities in leveraging the Internet and the Internet of Things. And of course, this whole transition, which has happened in a short period of time, uh, really affects the kinds of employments and the kinds of jobs and the kind of work that we'll be doing for now and uh, uh, some ideas of what may happen in the future. The timeline for the evolution of the Internet of Things, well, it was first coined by a gentleman that's still alive, of course, and at MIT, Kevin Ashton. But back in 1999, he had to make a presentation to the Procter & Gamble Board of uh, Directors about RFID technology or tagging technology for products on managing their supply chains. And he came up with the uh, idea of actually tying the IRFID tags to the Internet. Hence, that was the first year use of the word, the Internet of Things, 1999. Uh, since then, he's gone on to develop many companies in that technology, as well as uh, making himself quite wealthy in the process. All right. In 2005, the International Telecommunications Un uh, Union said that not only will we have connectivity for anyone anywhere in the world, but we will now have connectivity for anything. Anything can be connected and creates dynamic new networks. 2008, an alliance of many of the companies from Silicon Valley and other parts of the uh, European uh, equivalents came together and said, how can we promote the use of the internet protocol, IP, by embedding it in all sorts of objects or devices or machinery? And in 2008, the US National Intelligence Council listed the Internet of Things as one of the six most disruptive technologies that's going to come upon uh, manufacturing, operations, uh, economies, uh, and all businesses. 
The actual business started to launch really back in 2008 and 9, primarily with uh, the Cisco Internet Group when they were keeping track of how many people were using uh, the Internet, the Internet of Things and mobile devices that had that. And it was back in 2009 that the number of devices connected to, to the Internet was 12.5 billion in 2010, while the world's human population only increased 6.8 billion. That's almost a factor of two, which means that what was happening is, is connecting up devices and things started to dominate the use of the Internet. And of course, that's what <clears throat> created the launch of really the word and the starting to be recognized by companies like General Electric, uh, Siemens, the big electrical manufacturers, all sorts of companies, the banks, the financial firms, and so on. In 2011, uh, there was a lot of concern that we were going to run out of internet addresses. So a new technology, IPv6, was launched, and basically this new protocol allows for two to the power of 128,000 addresses, or 340 undecillion addresses to be available. One scientist, and I still have a hard time believing this, said that that would allow us to put an IPv6 address to every atom on the surface of the Earth, and still have enough addresses left to do another 100 Earths. So we have no fear of running out of uh, labels for any device or whatever at this point in time. And finally, at 2015, we're coming to the position where this is becoming a more mature technology. It's being adopted rapidly. It's at the top of the hype curve and now being uh, implemented by many uh, companies. There are many definitions for it, but the one that uh, really took hold the most was really in Germany, which of course has a very strong industrial workforce uh, itself, and one that's educated uh, for manufacturing and for doing uh, uh, jobs at the manufacturing level. And they had put together a government education and companies together to come up with a very good definition of it and all aspects of it. And that's when the term Industry 4.0 came out and then uh, also labels like Industrial IoT. Since then, many organizations have adopted uh, these concepts and ideas with little twists to their, uh, either their positioning in a marketplace as a for instance, IBM or GE or uh, ABB and Siemens as electrical manufacturers, the ones I'm more familiar with. Uh, the European Parliament uh, has come up with definitions. And uh, still, Germany is sort of a leader in uh, promoting this technology for factory and industrial automation. And since then, more than hundreds of suppliers have also adopted definitions and finding their niche or role in this area. Why is it occurring now? Well, first of all, hardware or equipment costs for sensors and actuators that are used in the uh, manufacturing operations have been dropping dramatically, as well as the uh, new technologies, nanotechnologies available. So it's allowed us to measure many, many more things that we couldn't measure before at a very low cost. And broadband internet communications allow us to add many more devices to such networks. So we're creating huge volumes of data uh, in manufacturing operations. The hardware is much smaller, more powerful, uses less power, reducing its cost. We all know how ubiquitous and cheap mobility is with this device, our computer in the pocket. And of course, this technology has made huge leaps and bounds uh, in automation and factory automation. A lot of new tools developed by universities and that in the area of analyzing data, new mathematical ideas and principles that were used a long time ago 
as philosophic uh, things are now being applied, Bayesian belief networks, artificial intelligence, etc. And finally, there's a huge mass market awareness of this potential of this technology. I don't know, I'm sure all of you have watched the TV commercials about General Electric, who the young man comes in to meet his grandfather or uncle, and he's just graduated from school, high school, I think, and his grandfather gives him the sledgehammer he used in the steel mill, okay? <laughs> And the kid sort of looks at him amazed and said, no, Dad, I'm going to work for GE, and I'm going to help automate industries, okay? And, and that impact of that ad has been so successful in converting so many young people to seek a career in these areas. So that's some of the history that's going on in it, and it's rapidly accelerated. Here's a slide that shows you the top areas of where this is being applied. And of course, the very largest area is in connected industry, the top category. And there's three categories, the Americas, which leads in most of these categories, Europe, the gray, and the black is Asia Pacific. And then there's a trend line here, and you can see that Applying this technologies in the industry is, is, of course, the largest, but it's also uh, the one uh, that has the most value to. The second one, you may be surprised to see, is really the whole issue of creating smart city, cities, integrating our electricity grids, our water supply, our gas supply, uh, parking meters, our lighting. So many uh, applications are being developed here. And then, of course, smart energy, which is our electrical transmission, distribution, and power generation scheme is being totally applied to this area. And here, also in Pittsburgh, is the connected car and the activities going on in uh, Uber and Lyft and the total transformation of the automobile industry towards the self-driving car. Then there's other areas from Surprisingly, smart agriculture is using this technology extensively. Not so much the retail and the consumer industries at this point in time, but that is coming quickly now. A key factor in this technology of IoT is many, many more measurements and field devices. And a process plant like the Shell Cracker has measurements of flow, pressure, temperature, level, humidity. But we've also developed new uh, technologies to measure things like friction, corrosion, uh, vibrations, and so on. So a plant now has many, many sensors in it that measure things just like our eyes, our ears, our smell, our senses, et cetera. A key measurement in these plants is the composition of the material at the feedstock of the plant and all the way through as it gets converted by the many processes. And that's also the key measurement that helps you determine the quality of the products you're making and so on. Where we can't develop any hardware or sensing devices, we now have neural networks and artificial intelligence that allow us to infer the physical properties of uh, other elements and molecular activity. So that software tool is now being applied more and more in this area. The Internet of Things uh, functions which enable this are primarily on this slide, three areas, connectivity, connecting things with a IP address, to a large database. Secondly, that database doesn't have to be sent to a big computer on site, but to the cloud. And communication from devices to the cloud now is normal. And then the data is accumulated up in the cloud, and huge volumes of it are, and we apply mathematical algorithms to do, filter it, determine and get insight into correlations and so on. The activity that scientists always used to do at the laboratory, but it can be done now automatically. And then finally, application developments, how to modify workflows and processes to do 
uh, monitoring and control of the electric grid, monitoring and control of the dangerous processes that are in the chemical plants. So some of the ways that the chemical industry is applying this is really the journey that they're taking and Shell is no exception to this, neither is Dow and neither is uh, DuPont and a number of other BASF and other people. So I thought I'd give you on this slide a little bit of insight of the functions that go on in a petrochemical plant. And over to the left you see two areas of responsibilities and roles, leading people or managing the people and information management, running a process or a plant today highly depends on having real time, very fast information for decision making because of the criticality of the process or the speed of its operation. And the typical functions in a process plant like the shell cracker are operations. Someone has to operate and monitor and control the equipment that's in the plant. And then maintenance, how do you sustain and keep the equipment available and running constantly for 24-7 requirements? And there's been many, many uh, improvements in the operation of maintenance in the process plants. Many of you have uh, parents or family that came from the steel industry. Maintenance was a big issue and it was not very automated at that time. Today we can predict the failure of most motors and machinery and generators and turbines many months before by using reliability-centered maintenance techniques that were developed for the aircraft industry and the aerospace industry and, and the air transportation industry. The other area of activity, and these are all what are called operational technologies. The other area is to create and improve the operations of the plant. There are management of many transfer of technologies or new technologies developed perhaps by Shell or other process licensors that will be applied to the plant once it's running and operational. Improving the asset utilization, in other words, getting the most out of every piece of equipment that's in the plant without breaking it or operating it to its total limit. Managing that curve is an optimization problem, which is also handled by gathering all this data. And finally, these plants are live all the time. They're being modified, upgraded, enhanced, uh, and constantly being improved. So there are engineering functions that have to occur all through this time. Now in this organizational structure, I think you can start to see a picture of all the potential types of roles and responsibilities and jobs that are going to be necessary in this plant and the kinds of things that will be outsourced locally and internationally to accomplish, which means there's a huge opportunity for much uh, development of outsourced businesses and engineering and technical services and maintenance services available. And I think some of my colleagues from Louisiana will be talking about that spin-off for the local communities. So taking those functional areas of managing and operating the plant, uh, the technology, improving the asset utilization, I've got little labels here where they're either engineering technologies, operation technologies, or information technologies. And what we see the Internet of Things doing is actually allowing, because of the connectivity, because of the large database we now have and bringing all the data together in one place, the convergence of all of these activities in this fundamental architecture of the Internet of Things. Another way to describe what this allows us, and this is a conceptual sort of model, is first of all, uh, the Internet of Things actually moves things from the physical world to the digital world and back to the physical world. And that's sort of a unique 
idea or concept. We've always been doing sort of this thing in process automation and manufacturing, but we never described it this way. You first establish a digital record of everything you're doing within the plant operations by measuring things, by inputting data, by uh, getting data from the weather, uh, other sort of financial, economic data, everything else. You put all that data together in a big data source. You then move that to somewhere where you can analyze that data and categorize it and put it in context of what you're trying to do in your business operations. And then finally, and that's where you put it into the digital world. The, and then finally, in the third step, you actually take that data and the insight and the ability to help make decisions in that and bring it back to the physical world by actually adjusting speeds of motors, uh, control valves, and other operations and actually control the plant. So it's another conceptual way of seeing the potential of what can be done uh, today. And of course, the way that this plays out for a chemical company is you can have tremendous impact on your business operations by improving productivity, reducing risk with smart manufacturing, smart supply chain planning. And of course, you can have growth because this is incremental revenue potential with new business models where you can actually sell uh, smart products and services to your customers as well, even in the chemical industry. There are now smart chemical products that come with services for the customer that's using them. Uh, these play in smart manufacturing, the key areas of application are predicting asset management, like I said, when does a piece of equipment fail so that you do not do uh, an emergency situation, you plan your maintenance, process management and control, the fundamental things of process automation, energy management and reducing waste is possible, safety management, connecting people, the processes and the equipment, and of course, supply chain planning. Another area that sometimes touches the plant is research and development and creating new products for customers. And in the polyethylene phase of Shell Chemical Plant, they will be required to modify their operations to create polyethylene that will suit the feedstock of other types of manufacturing processes. This will assist in that area. And of course, selling smart products and services. So that's really what every chemical company is up to at this point in time. And Shell also has embraced this digital transformation process, or they labeled it a little bit different by being members of the Open Group, which is an international body uh, creating standards and ways of operating uh, in this uh, architecture. I'm not going to read this. You can read these later when I hand these out. But there's been uh, Mary Jarrett, who's the IT general manager of Shell globally for manufacturing, has been at the leadership of bringing these standards to the industry. Some key facts on how big Shell's IT landscape is. They have over 5,000 business applications of software that have to be managed worldwide. That's a huge number. ExxonMobil's not even that big. I don't know why Shell is bigger, whether that's a, an issue of the multiple areas of business they're in or what, but uh, the number of desktops, uh, close to 200,800 sites around the world, 25,000 servers, and those will be reduced as more and more of this data is put into clouds. And the number of IT staff, 10,000, which includes direct employees, as well as um, uh, outsourced contractors. And all of the chemical industry is moving towards much more outsourcing, which then creates more business opportunities for new companies here locally in outsourcing these kind of IT services to the plant. <clears throat> so with the, some of the 
disruptive technologies and ecosystem changes that Shell has to respond to and why they've chosen an IoT type of strategy is number one, to cut costs, increase using cloud solutions, which allow you to buy IT services that not own the equipment associated with it, escalating the number of connected devices to the network, which is happening everywhere, many interfaces between those 5,000 applications to bring data from one application to another application, uh, changes and releases in software is the biggest management problem that these people have with people like Microsoft and others constantly upgrading it. I'm sure you all are familiar with your frustrations of moving from one operating system to another. Uh, and the need to manage man more and more outsourced services, not direct in-house services. So. It's all of those areas that uh, demand really changes in the way people work and, and do things compared to the way it was just a few years ago. Now, the main issue of discussion here, I think from some of my colleagues here too, is the preparation for the workforce for change and these kind of technological changes and the need for them as a way of uh, not just uh, improving operations and uh, asset utilization, but also uh, to uh, supply more uh, work for people uh, around such facilities. In Houston, when I was there as the head of Yokogawa, we had a group of uh, operating plants that we brought together every three months or so on, and we wanted to analyze how each of the plants and operations in the Houston area were uh, recruiting, retaining, and encouraging new people to join the business, especially younger people. And a consulting company called McBassey and Company, Lori McBassey, she's a pioneer in the use of uh, analytics and data and surveying to develop new policies for human capital uh, management and investment. And you know the saying that every CEO says, you know, our best asset is our people. Well, very few people understand how that asset is so valuable when you start valuing the company. She has come up with ways of doing this such that when a company is up for sale today, a larger company, we do assess the human capital that's in that company and assign a valuation to it for the actual final price of the company, especially if it's in technology or uses technology. So we've asked them to do a survey of some plants, uh, DuPont, FMC, Gulf Chemical, Styrulation, and so on, about some of the drivers for recruitment, retention, motivation. And we asked it in a specific way uh, across the generational differences that existed in 2012. This was 2012. The boomer employee, the Gen X employee, the Gen Y population. And today, if we were to do this, we'd have to include the Gen Z uh, uh, generation, which is the ones born uh, from 1996 or under the internet influence, okay? All of these others here up until 2012 were really did not have that sort of, uh, it was only in Gen Y or the men millennials as sometimes they're called uh, and some of the Gen X that they were familiar with computer technologies. So they came up with an analysis this of, and here's just a brief summary of the survey and there's some charts that, that show some of this. The most important drivers for the operator, the owners and operators of such plants was when they hired Gen Y people, the supervisor was an extremely important influence on them. They needed the mentorship, the guidance, and the direction of a supervisor. Those plants that had good supervisors managing such people had strong retention, very good employee morale, etc. It was rather amazing to see that. Boomers were 
uh, of which I guess I might still be a boomer, but not quite, all right. <laughs> but boomers really appreciated really good work environments. That's what kept them going, okay. And Gen Xs really were a mixture of those two. But all generations agreed that openness to employees' ideas about how to make things work or being asked questions, asking what do you think we should do? How do you uh, think you could contribute to what we're trying to accomplish? Was a major motivator factor. And clearly the survey showed that generations differ in what they seek from jobs. And it's time to do such a study now with the Gen Z or iGen or internet generation. Uh, the charts were quite simple. You can see it here. There were some issues here uh, overall. And then boomers, Gen Xs, and what their responsiveness is by the categories of the colored dots here. And you can, you can see these summaries coming out on these charts here, okay? Um, in terms of uh, uh, the bottom one there where uh, almost everyone agreed to uh, uh, the issue that employee ideas about how to make things work better uh, was very much uh, endorsed by all generations. The supervisor relationship clearly showed is by the number of dots and the color of the dots that it was Gen Y that valued the supervisor relationship the most. And this was characteristic of a, a population of about 40 or 50 plants. And how to attract the employees, okay. Uh, this was uh, pretty variable across the map, but again, attracting employees, the motivations of Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z are very different than the boomer generation, which mainly wanted uh, advancement or stability in their career and a reasonable salary. Gen Y wanted to be vice presidents after three months on the job, okay? <laughs> and I'm sure the Gen Z are gonna say, forget it, okay? If you don't call me vice president right away, I'm not coming, and there are situations like that. So. Such a survey or study, uh, I think, would be very useful, and it may be one uh, that educators here or HR people here may want to consider. Um, learning from past industrial revolutions, and this is an issue that's uh, very political and debatable, is that as these waves of new technology come in, there is a fear that jobs are eroded or disappearing. That has been shown by the studies in Germany and other, other studies here that that's really not the case. The jobs change and they require different skill sets. And that's what we've got to focus on. And in the case, there was a book written about this, The Second Machine Age, which was a little not so optimistic in my opinion, but at the same time did point out this problem uh, of uh, the changes and how fast they happen and how they leave some people behind if you do not have continuous education. And that's one of the key areas for the educators in the room, I think, is how do we continually keep workforces and the owner operators of such one, how do we keep people continuously educated? In my opinion, Germany has done a much better job at that with the Mittelstahn companies that are there, the private companies that are there they plow a lot of their profits back into educating their workforce. But anyway, uh, the study, uh, this one study here with Boston Consulting Group and IoT Analytics showed that Germany, uh, even though they have a lot of automation, more maybe than we do, especially in factory automation, would, see, would need to see a net increase in skill sets around the Internet of Things over the next 10 years, which would add uh, about 350,000 jobs or more uh, in that 10-year period. So uh, that's one study that indicates what happened here. This one, move on. Why did it halt? Did I put my hand on this somewhere? Huh? Oh, escape. 
Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Some of the challenges for the manufacturing community, like, like I was talking about, is retain, retrain current employees. In some of these newer technologies, that gets harder and harder to do, but it's still possible. Uh, adopting new work and organizational models, the new people working right now want many more flexible schedules than they have in traditional jobs. And the reason for that is that they value their work-life balance. The Gen Xs and Gen Ys definitely value that. Uh, recruiting, uh, this is where the educators, or let's say our society, has to put less emphasis on the degrees and roles or the, the uh, qualifications that are necessary to do these new jobs. In fact, you have to look for other characteristics in recruiting people. And I was talking on the telephone with RB the other day, I mean, one issue in deciding on plant operators is the fact that you have to have people that are, who want to be technically challenged, uh, intellectually challenged, but at the same time, they have to put up with working in an environment that's outside, that may not be so clean, has some safety issues and so on. Not unlike the steel industry was many years ago, but they are good jobs, so uh, you, you do have to accommodate yourself to that, and some people cannot. Okay, so those things have to be outlined and found out ahead of time. It's very important that the owner operators of such plants really put together a strategic workforce planning operation and think of what's coming next, what are the technological changes, what are the skill sets that are going to be needed or modified in the plant from the day you start operating that plant. So there's a big role for the owner operators to uh, handle this training activity. The education community, community has to look at how do we develop broader skill sets that go across functional areas. Right now we focus on specific di disciplines. It might be uh, mechanics, it might be electrical, and so on. But in this whole new world of the Internet of Things, these things are all converging. So you need to be able to have, be flexible enough to understand some of the fundamentals. And the fundamental education has to bring that forward. Close the IT skill gaps. That is still, I think, an area that needs more attention, more curriculum, more new programs in that. I know that the operator training institutes and so on have emphasized process automation and control and instrumentation, but they need to look at the software aspects and the IT aspects as well. And new formats for continuing education. It's not just uh, going to a classroom, maybe more. I'm a graduate of a cooperative education school where we alternated one quarter of college with one quarter of actual work experience. I think that's the best way to really decide whether you want to work in an engineering and an environment like this, okay? Without that, you will be very discouraged the day you go into your first day on the job, okay? <laughs> Not only that, but it also accelerates your career path dramatically. You do spend one extra year going to college, but your rewards are later on in promotion and salary. Now what happened? Challenges for the future, um, retraining the employees is going to be a key issue, but the technology movement, especially artificial intelligence and deep learning and things like the IBM Watson are actually going to lead us toward working in jobs where our manager or our supervisor might be a computer telling you what to do. This is where we're headed, and we have to be prepared for that as well. That's not as frightening as it may seem, because experiments already with this show that the new employees have no problem with that whatsoever. It's the older employees that do. So my conclusions is, first of all, think about all this technology disruption as really 
the, uh, the shift between the physical, the digital, and back to the physical, and taking advantage of digitizing whatever we can. And that's going to be a skill set and a, a job role for everybody in the future. The chemical industry, fortunately, has been measuring many things, gathering tremendous amounts of data and operating these plants. So they're actually ahead of many other industries in applying such techniques and technologies. They just have to do it uh, and have the management commitment to do it. And finally, it's really the agility of the people in the organization in adopting to this change that determines how effectively they adopt this, this industry 4.0 and take advantage of it in increased operating efficiency, more profitability, less risk, greater safety. And that really is uh, what I'd like to say. It's both positive and a little bit scary at times in the next roles we have in working uh, with this technology. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning. Welcome again. My name is Dennis Nichols. I'm vice chairman of the Beaver County Chamber of Commerce and also head of the Economic Development Task Force. And as Jack uh, alluded to a little bit earlier this morning, uh, back in March, uh, along with one of the other members, Karen Teams, of our Economic Development Task Force, we visited uh, Titusville, Pennsylvania, Cross Creek Resort for a day-long seminar, much of which was to talk about the ethane cracker plant, and, uh, and, and we felt that, that that was a very worthwhile day for us. We, we heard many speakers throughout the day, and several of those were from Louisiana. Uh, one of those speakers in particular was R.B. Smith, who was with us this morning, and uh, we were very impressed by not only the general presentation, but RB in particular had the opportunity to speak with him briefly that morning, and uh, soon thereafter followed up and started to work on trying to get RB to come and speak to us here in southwestern Pennsylvania. So we're very pleased to have him here today uh, with us. And in addition to that, as we were developing uh, the presentations for today, we thought we'd like to expand it into some additional areas. And uh, one of those was into the retail banking and retail market and so forth and see how we might be able to address those needs. And RB very graciously uh, uh, introduced us to Sarita Chauvins, who will be our next speaker. Uh, Sarita has uh, several years of experience, in fact, uh, 26 years of experience in the banking industry. She is Senior Vice President of Retail Marketing for Southwest Louisiana with Iberia Bank. I uh, had the opportunity last evening to spend a few minutes with her and get to know her a little bit better. I think you're going to be very pleased with the presentation that you hear from Sarita. Uh, I, I, I think uh, First National, who helped sponsor her being here today, uh, I had a very pleasant evening and I learned a lot of information about you know, what it's like in the, in the retail industry, in the finance industry, once you have uh, a large uh, company like Shell come into the area, and particularly an ethane cracker facility, uh, they're working with other types of co other companies, not Shell in particular, but similar type companies. So I think you're going to find, again, that Sarita has a very interesting presentation for us. Just to give you a little bit more information about her background, uh, she attended McNeese State University, where she studied psychology and completed the executive bank management program uh, offered through CBA at Furman University. She is active in Southwest Louisiana community, where she is a member, uh, she is a board member of Family and Youth Counseling Agency's Court Appointed Special Advocates Board. I, I actually chaired one of those or was involved in one of those com committees here in Western Pennsylvania, so good, good for you. Uh, chair of the Southwest Louisiana Chamber Workforce Development Committee. She's a member of the United Way Finance Committee, board member of the Education and Technical Center, and secretary of the Cal Calcasio? Uh, Calcasieu Parish Police Jury. Calcasieu Parish Police Jury Workforce Development Board. Sarita is married to William Chauvins, and together they have three children and two grandchildren. Let's give a warm Western Pennsylvania welcome to Sarita Chauvins. Thank you. I probably don't need the mic, but if I am too loud, you guys just do this, because I can be very loud. 
There are a couple of disclosures I want to start with. I'm in banking, so I have to start with the disclosures. First of all, I want to thank First National Bank for sponsoring me and bringing me here and the lovely dinner we had last night. You guys are, are, are wonderful folks to be with, and uh, especially Karen Teams, who coordinated the event. Also, the Beaver County um, Chamber and Dennis Nichols, he is uh, a true advocate for you guys, and y'all are very lucky to have that gentleman. Um, one of the other things that I want you guys to know before I actually get started is, is I created this presentation for you, specifically, with you in mind, and Beaver County. So what I did was several comparisons to Calcasieu Parish, which I may also say Lake Charles or Southwest Louisiana, but they're all basically the same space, um, just so that you guys know. And the, dat the data came from multiple sources. So some of it is as old as two years, and some of it is maybe a month old. So it interchanges quite a bit. If you see something and you go, really? It may be dated, but we, we didn't have a source for additional information. The last thing I need you guys to know is we call our counties parishes. So we're not just good Catholics down in Southwest Louisiana. <laughs> we live in parishes versus counties. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So, um, there we go, all right. We're on the internet, so the buffering may be a little slow this morning. This is a shameless plug for my employer, Iberia Bank. They are um, who actually allowed me to be here with you guys today, so I have to share a little bit about them. We are a 130-year-old organization. Uh, one, we are the largest bank in Louisiana. We're in eight states now, and our sweet spot is small business banking, somewhere between 500000 and $2 million. We have 12 branches in southwest Louisiana, and that's what I do. I have been in banking for right at 27 years now, and most of it has been in retail and small business banking. So, to introduce you guys a little bit more to Calcasieu Parish, yes, we do have alligators in Calcasieu Parish, and they do wander up on people's lawns periodically. Um, the, you know, the quote is, don't feed the gators because your dog might be next. So, so we have to be very cautious of that. We also are well known for Mardi Gras, and um, we are definitely well known for our seafood. We're about 30 miles from the Gulf Coast, and Calcasieu Parish actually butts up to Texas. So to give you guys a perspective of what Southwest Louisiana, where it is. Our metropolitan population is right at 205,000. That is growing exponentially as we sit here today. Major industries or energy, obviously, and hospitality, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Our median household income, 48,000, actually a little bit lower than you guys. And then our um, unemployment rate is 5%, which is well below the national average. Our job growth since 2015 has been an average of about 4.8% annually, which is pretty outstanding. And cost of living in Southwest Louisiana is right at 4.5%, which is below the national average. So here's something else that you guys need to know about Southwest Louisiana. This is where we really differ, I think, from Beaver County. Our poverty level is 17.1%. So almost 33,000 people in Southwest Louisiana live at or below the poverty level, which is 2.4% above the national average. So we have a lot of folks that are um, poor. And the greatest concern in Calcasieu Parish are females between the age of 18 and 34. Just so happens, that's the millennial generation. If you look at the slide, our demographics, we have about 68% of white or Caucasian, which is well below what you guys have. Y'all are right at the 90 mark. And 32% of our population is black or African American. The other slide on top of the, there is kind of an idea of what our population looks like and um, our national or our median age. I wanted to share this with you because it's something that you guys need to plug into 
as a, as a community. And so I wanted to share this with you and then go back in a, a little bit later on in the presentation and share with you what Beaver County looks like. So our poverty level, and that's this, the slide um, on top, 18 to 24 year olds. You guys know what generation that is? Millennials, yeah. And then we have 25 to 34 year olds and most of those are female that are in that population. So degrees in Calcasieu Parish. Here's something that I felt like would be very interesting to you guys because we have really worked hard to increase our, our availability to our young folks to get in and out of a university in whatever time frame they need and to be prepared for the workforce. Um, we have done an, an exceptional job in that area, so much so that Sowella Technical Community College actually graduates more people than our local university. They're at 55.1% and our local <laughs> university is at 37%. Most of those graduating are in nursing, and then next is accounting and finance, and then you, our millennials like to major in general studies because they just don't know what they wanna be when they grow up. So you guys don't have as much of a problem around that. 21.6% 20, of our, our um, high schoolers graduate from college within a four year period. And 7.3 of those move away from Calcasieu Parish. They may be moving here soon, right? <laughs> Let's talk about Beaver County and what you guys look like. So the majority of your students go to Geneva College, and then 35% of your students go to the local community college. And I see that actually being an opportunity for you guys. Um, it, it will give you guys an opportunity to help your youth um, determine what direction that they wanna go in and um, more offerings from your community college would probably be something that you guys would wanna look into in the very short period of time. Most of your guys, um, your graduates are or in business admin and human services but you guys have a, a really large population in the healthcare industry. So apparently they're getting that from somewhere else. So the, to further introduce your, you to our area, we are very heavily involved in petrochemicals. It's our number one industry in Southwest Louisiana. Petrochemical is just a hybrid word for petroleum and chemicals. We all create that together. We have 16 chemical plants currently three processors of oil and gas, two refineries, and one, one LNG export facility. But that's about to change. So we're in 2010, 2011, 2012, we're on our happy way, right? And then boom, what happens? The announcement. We have eight LNG export terminals that have announced either expansion or, or, or actually ground up construction in Southwest Louisiana. That includes Calcasieu and Cameron Parish. And they're not, just, they're not just investing in their facilities, they're investing in the entire communities. So Chenier Energy is investing $20 billion in their facility, it is underway currently. Sempra, $10 billion. South, South Carol, uh, California Telephone and Energy, 9.3 billion. Venture Global is at four and a quarter billion. All of this is in Cameron Parish. Then we have the G2 LNG facility, 11 billion. These are all transport facilities that are working on their way because of the cracker plant and we'll get to that in a moment. Magnolia LNG, 3.5, Delphin at seven, and Driftwood is at $2 billion. So currently, we have un announced 65 billion and under construction, 30, but that's probably changed since I put this up together and it's the underway is probably a much higher number. Just so that you guys 
can see what's going on in southwest Louisiana. And all of these are spurred on by Sasol, right? So Sasol is investing $11 billion to construct an ethylene cracker and derivatives project. They're turning gas into liquid, just like what you guys are looking at with Shell. The construction began in March of 2015, and it will be, once it's complete, it'll employ 528 permanent employees and 358 what they call temporary employees or contract labor. Their payroll looks like it's gonna be around $58.9 million a year. So do you guys wanna see what $11 billion buys you? Let's look at that. We are the bridge city. <laughs> there are 206 bridges in Calcasieu Parish. This is the heavy haul route. This is their existing facility that they already have functioning in Southwest Louisiana. The blue represents all the new construction that is underway. and they'll sh this is what they'll build around it. So now we know what $11 billion buys you. Let's talk about Sasol's commitment to Southwest Louisiana. And I already see Shell doing similar things in your community just by talking to you guys. I wanted to show you this sheet. Now, this is straight off of Sasol's website, and you can tell an engineer probably put it together because it's so busy. So I'll explain it to you guys. <laughs> So Sasol, one of the things that people like R.B. Smith did initially when Sasol said, hey, I'm coming into your community, it's going to be great, we're going to create all these jobs, he said, don't stop there. We need you guys to buy local. That's what's really going to make this economy just flourish. And they said, okay, sure, we'll put out the RFPs, we'll go out on bid on every contract that we have, and, you know, the best, may the best company win. And I will tell you, it's pretty amazing what has happened. So they've already spent more than $2.5 billion on procurement, which is committed to Louisiana-based contractors, or, or a portion of that is based on Louisiana-based contractors, which is kind of that um, list there to the right-hand side. When you look at who they've employed, right now they have 400 full-time employees that are hired with an anticipation of 500 more permanent positions. 87% of those employees are from Louisiana and 73% are from Calcasieu Parish. So that is pretty exciting stuff, which is the same thing you guys can absolutely do. Most of their vendors are in Louisiana. 93 of their suppliers actually were awarded from Louisiana. 
which translates to about $471 million. In Calcasieu Parish alone, our, our portion of that is 60 or $96 million. So a huge portion of what they've spent in procurement is right there in Calcasieu Parish. They've also focused on minority and vet owned businesses. So 39 million ha has gone to those folks which um, translates to about 50 Calcasieu Parish businesses that have been awarded contracts with just with Sasol, not to mention the other LNG facilities. These are the things you guys have to look forward to whenever uh, Shell comes into your market. All right, so it doesn't stop there because when you have a facility this big, you have all kinds of organizations and industry that want to get in on the action, which creates more growth. So Axial is actually, which is another one of our petrochemical companies, they're spending $3 billion for an ethane cracker facility. Matheson Trigas is, has spent $130 million on a state of of the art air separation unit at Sasol, it's completed. Westlake Chemicals, $330 million on expanding its ethane production. That began in 2016. Indorama Ventures, they're taking a dormant ethane cracker and they're refurbishing it to make a, um, a, an ethane cracker. They're spending about $175 million on that and they're very close to completion. Dunsung Fintech, they are actually creating a cryogenic insulation manufacturing facility at our port. I don't know where that came from, but it just happened. Five million more dollars in our community. And then Union Pacific said, you know, these guys are going to be needing us at a top-notch speed, so we're going to we're going to invest 19 million dollars in our infrastructure so they they too have um, created some improvements the next thing i want to share with you guys is our employment our labor force and what that looks like if you if you look back on this scale in 2010 we weren't doing so great in calcasieu parish we, we actually had more people leaving Calcasieu Parish than staying, and that number of graduates was much higher. They'd get their education and then they would leave for better jobs. But that all changed with this announcement. And one of the other things that we have done with the help of people like R.B. Smith is we've created an environment that millennials want to live in, which we have to think about that with millennials. It's not just about a great work environment, it's also about their home environment. And so we've, we've got dog parks every corner, no, just joking, not, not every corner, but we have a plethora of dog parks now because they love their animals, they're non-committal, so they don't get married until later. <laughs> If, if you're a millennial, I apologize. Um, they're very savvy and smart, and they do a lot of research. Um, but in 2015, we actually hit the um, 100,000 mark, which was a huge feat for Calcasieu Parish, because as you can see from that graph, we, we have been struggling for many, many years. And since the announcements, it's been exponential, meteoric growth in our community. Again, something to look forward to. So I want to share you guys, with you guys a little bit of a comparison here. Um, Beaver County is on the top and Calcasieu is on the bottom. This is an industry comparison by labor force. So this is, this is um, what you guys look like as it pertains to healthcare, manufacturing, the big three, and retail. Um, I, I was a little surprised to see that y'all were so strong in healthcare when um, I didn't see a lot of people graduating in the medical industry in this area. So it was uh, something for you guys to think about, right, as you progress. But our counties, or our, your county, our parish, very similar as it pertains to the workforce. All right, this is, next slide blows me away. This is our population growth in Calcasieu Parish. I only went back to 2011 because um, I felt like it would get too busy. Um, but as you can see, the announcements were made between 11 and 12. 
And from that point in time, we have just be, been growing. As you could see from the previous slide, we were actually declining in workforce, and now we are growing like bad weeds in Southwest Louisiana. We've had 6,776 new jobs from 11 to 16. Or I'm sorry, not jobs, but population, which is really big for us. All right, so my banker friends are really gonna love this slide. Don't let the direction of the graph fool you. What I did, because um, you know, I'm a banker, is I wanted to know uh, how are these people, or what, what does their credit look like, right? That's what we always want to know if we're going to do business with them. Well, this actually is a, a slide that indicates what subprime or below subprime credit has done in Calcasieu Parish. So bear with me for a moment. What it's saying is between 40 and 41% in first quarter of 2014, our population in Calcasieu Parish was th at that percentage as it pertains to below prime or subprime, meaning their credit score was so low that most banks wouldn't touch them. With the influx and all of the new jobs and all of the great people moving into our areas, we're actually increasing the credit worthiness of our population. So something really awesome to look forward to, especially if you're in banking. <laughs> Property values. We, we had a little chat about that last night at dinner. Okay, so <clears throat> three short years ago, our median household income was 141.7. As of 2016, there was no data for 2017. It just keeps moving. There's, it's just a crazy movement. We're at 163.740, and we still don't have enough houses. So I took this picture of this new subdivision, and they are bragging about the fact that they are selling homes for $180,000. And these are 1,200 square foot row houses where people, they're just building as many subdivisions as, as they can find the land to build on. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for you guys. If you have rental property today, fix it up because you're gonna definitely wanna use it very, very soon. So the banking environment, definitely had to share this slide with you guys. So what you see on this first slide or the, basically the five um, largest banks in Southwest Louisiana and what our growth looks like from, um, and this, this came directly from FDIC. So it's a little bit dated, but it's from June 13th compared to June of 2016. Um, even though most of the national banks have attrited some of their branches, we personally have, um, we've sold seven of our branches, um, that we are still growing. As a matter of fact, we, we actually have number one market share in Southwest Louisiana now, and I will tell you the reason why is because we've really leveraged the opportunity with what we call bank at work and going out to some of these municipalities that are benefiting from the taxes this slide does not do it justice, but we are number one market share, and in 2013, technically we were number three. So we've, we've grown, but we've taken advantage of it, and the national banks just are not doing that. The next slide gives you an idea of what's happening with the smaller banks in Southwest Louisiana. JD Bank has built or bought five additional banks in the last two years. They are just investing heavily in the area. And I only put banks on this list that are 100,000 or above. There are three more banks that have moved into town. We have a total of seven new banks in our market that weren't here two years ago. The new banks that are moving in are really focused on their smaller banks and they're, they're focused on one somewhat of that low to moderate income household. All right, taxable sales. How do you measure your economy? Through the taxes people pay. So this slide is a little squirrely, I wanna, I, but I wanna I want kinda go through it to make sure that you, you guys understand exactly what I'm trying to share with you here. So this is an average monthly taxable sales number, and it's stated in millions. 
And what I did was because there was so much data, I didn't want to confuse things too much, but the large numbers in the boxes through the graph are actually a monthly figure. What I did was I averaged each first quarter I want for, for one month of production. That way you guys could kind of see what does one month in Calcasieu Parish now look like in compared to first quarter of 2013. As you can see, taxable sales, wow, through the roof. Um, we've, we've gained uh, a monthly right at $177 million per month from 13 which translates to about 1.6 billion a year. All right, so now people are paying all of these taxes. Would you guys care to guess who is, is growing the quickest in Calcasieu Parish as far as an industry? And what? I, I didn't hear you. Say it. <laughs> Grocery stores and merchandise. Oh yeah. Walmart. They are moving in and let me tell you, they are taking over. We have three new neighborhood Walmarts in Kakashi Parish and there's a um, rumor that there will be two more. We also have another major uh, grocery store that has moved in and one other under construction. Huge. Groceries and merchandise. If you're in that industry, you definitely want to talk to your banker about getting a line of credit because be ready, it's gonna happen. Oh, and building materials had an extremely large percentage of increase too. So I wanna share with you guys what that looks like by category. Now what you see here is that, that same first quarter information going back to 2013. And I, again, I just, I, I wanted to get some really solid numbers for you, so I averaged them, and these are stated in the millions. Um, food, obviously, merchandise, huge. Furniture, not so much. I guess, you know, our millennials sleep on Kia or Ikea, I don't know. Um, building materials, as you can see, meteoric growth. And motor vehicles, surprisingly, decline just a little bit. So people must be keeping their vehicles longer. Maybe they're making them better, who knows. Okay, so we just talked about the sales tax and who's paying it. Let's talk about um, these sales taxes as it pertains to the total dollars in our market. As you can see in 2013, this is stated in the millions. In 2013, we're talking 238 million dollars as a, as compared to today 345 million dollars taxes collected by our tax assessor's office so wow whoever benefits from that is going to be feel like they have the golden goose in their pocket um ad valorem taxes want to share that with you first these are these are um purchase items businesses pay ad valorem taxes as you can tell, from 2013 to 16, we're, we went from 2 billion to 2.3 billion, which is a, a 330 million dollar change from from 13 to 16. So, who's benefiting from these taxes? I don't know how you guys work your um, your your tax system. I did not go into that because I, I I figured you guys were way better experts at it than I am. But our Cal Calcasieu Parish School Board actually is the recipient of the majority of our taxes, which is fantastic because they are scrambling to build more schools right now. They are throwing up temporary buildings, especially for the elementary schools. And again, that's something you guys may wanna be prepared for as you progress. Uh, but but our, our Calcasieu Parish School Board in 2010, they were taken in for themselves about $80,000 a year, and as you can see, that number has basically doubled in this period of time. So they are absolutely benefiting greatly from those taxes. Just to give you guys a comparison of where our taxes go, our sales taxes, um, just like I said, about 40% of it goes to the Calcasieu Parish School Board. 
And then we have a, an entity called the Calcasieu Parish Police Jury, and it has nothing to do with police, and it has nothing to do with the judicial system. They actually run the infrastructure of Calcasieu Parish. So roads and um, everything you can think of as it pertains public to works. public works, drainage, water, you name it, those guys are in charge of it. So they get 17%. Our city, who also employs our, our um, Lake Charles Police Department, they get a nice chunk at 19%. And then the next biggest or largest piece of it goes to law enforcement, District 1, which is our Sheriff's Department. So we have Lake Charles Police Department and we have a Sheriff's Department. And I will tell you, those are our everyday heroes, those Sheriff, sheriff guys, because they're the search and rescuers. And with as much waterways as we have, we really need those folks. So as a comparison, I think that it's good for you guys to see where your dollars are going and um, compared to where we're putting our money. So property taxes, what's happening with raw land and lots? Well, I will tell you, a very smart man told me one day, invest in real estate because God's not making more land. But in Calcasieu Parish, he's making it more valuable. As you can see, our subdivision lots have gone up exponentially as it pertains to property taxes. And then land, all other, way more valuable in, at this time than it was in the past. Residential and commercial property taxes. Again, a exponential change in what is happening, especially in the business sector. So, if there are vacant buildings in your area, they will soon be consumed and utilized, which is a great thing for the, um, the, the community. I wanted to take a little bit deeper dive into our ad valorem because with change also comes different types of industries that really benefit from those changes. And I want you guys to be aware of what those industries look like. So there's business, furniture, and fixtures, definitely, um, definitely flat, just a little bit increase. Leased equipment is seeing a meteoric increase. So that is, if you're, if you're in the financial industry and you lease equipment, you definitely wanna be prepared. Um, our pipelines, you know, that's a big industry. They, they started gearing up and, and uh, purchasing pipelines and paying those ad valorem taxes for the use of those pipelines. So you can see there where that's, that's a big change. And then, of course, oil and gas wells. Um, that's been somewhat flat over this period of time. <laughs> I, had to, I had to add this because it's, it's just a really interesting dynamic of what happens in a, a parish or a county when you have a lot of industry that moves in and they depend on water to operate. Our uh, watercraft taxes or ad valorem went up exponentially in 2014 and that is due to the growth and the type of industry that is using water to help create their products. So pretty interesting there. Finally, I want to share with you guys that the um, industrial plants, the petrochemical area is not our only main employer in southwest Louisiana. We are also Little Las Vegas. We have um, four, actually five casinos. And we have Delta Downs. It's a racino, so they have horse racing there. We have a la Capri, which is a casino. L'Auberge du Lac came in 2005, they are a major employer, and they also have a uh, resort that goes along with, with their casino. And then just moving in, in December of 2014, imagine that, um, is the Golden Nugget, and that is a privately owned casino. You can see the owner's yacht sitting right in front of the casino that he, he uh, travels in from time to time. Serena, he's replacing that one with a bigger yacht. He's got a bigger yacht well, he now? Ordered a bigger yacht. He ordered a bigger yacht, so next time we see each other, I'll show you a picture of the larger yacht. Um, these casinos 
you know, from week to week, their their um, numbers adjust. This is a little. This data is a little old. Um, about 6,435 employees between the four between the four casinos. So that's pretty much the end of Calcasieu Parish. There is a couple of things that I want to share with you guys about your parish. And again, I want you to know that it's just stuff for you to have food for thought. I hope that I create some question in your mind as to what you guys can do next. Um, what you want to prepare for, hard, uh, housing shortages. And look, I just took these pictures. I took them from my car driving down the street about a week ago. Be prepared for traffic issues and housing shortages. Uh, nobody wants a man camp in their backyard, but you definitely don't want a bunch of abandoned real estate when, whenever that first rush moves on. And that is what will happen. They will hire up in order to construct the facility, and then the permanent positions will be much lower than that initial wave, right? So what you can see there, there were about 15 buses, and those are all employees going to either one of the LNGs or to Sasol. They are the construction workers, and they transport them to help with some of the traffic from the main camps to the facility where they work. Definitely an, an, an ongoing issue in Southwest Louisiana, and you want to invest in your infrastructure. Again, this um, this other billboard I took a picture of new homes from 180s. The the 160 one apparently was a little outdated, so within a month they've gone from 160 to 180 that they're touting. So enough about Calcasieu. What I want to share with you guys is just a little bit of data about your community and this is beaver county's population by generation and looking at this guys i would i would go to sleep tonight thinking what can we do in order to make some dynamic changes in this community because your baby boomers make up 32 percent of your population that's that's huge and I'm not, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but millennials have surpassed baby boomers in buying power. So that's another thing you wanna think about. Your Gen Xers, 28%. So combined between your baby boomers and your Gen Xers, which is you know, 35 and above, you're looking at 61% of your population. Your most at risk at this point are your Gen Xers, and those are, you know, those 17 to 22 year olds, the ones that you want to educate and get them into a great job. Remember, your millennials have to have the dog parks and the entertainment outside of work, so they're very social people, and they want not just a quality work work environment; they want quality lifestyle. So that's just something I wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of and know that that is an area you want to focus on as you progress. And then the, the last slide I have for you guys is regarding to your secondary in, um, education versus your workforce. It's a very busy slide, and I apologize for that, but it's really good data, and I'm more than happy to send it to anybody that is interested in it. But this is your population between 18 and 24 years old. It's a comparison between 2010 and 2016, and who, who has done what as far as education? So, so basically right now, you guys have 13,391 uh, that fall between the 18 to 24 year old population in Beaver County. You, in 2010, you had a few more than you have today. What really interests me is that uh, the, the column going down where it says some college or associate's degree. So you guys in 2010 had 42% of, of your high school graduates going to college. Today you have 40%, which is a decline of about 337 folks. Getting their bachelor's degree though, the ones that are going to school are graduating, which is fantastic. So that's good news. But I wanted you guys to see what's happening in your female population too. So your females in 2016 are not 
being educated the same way your males are, or they don't have the desire to be educated in, in the same capacity your males are. So that too is something that you guys will probably want to think about because your females definitely outnumber your males in Beaver County. So with that said, that is all I have for you guys today. I hope it was helpful and I look forward to maybe one day meeting all of you guys again. And thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Just to give you a little bit more background about RB, he is Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development for the Southwest Louisiana Economic Development Alliance. That's a mouthful. Uh, but he's got a lot of experience in very many different areas. And let me just give you some of the, the initial background. Uh, it says here, as a native of New Orleans, uh, R.B. Smith did not begin his life in southwest Louisiana. He, he got there as fast as he could. A resident of Lake Charles since 1976, R.B.'s career has included working in retail, wholesale, service, and educational industries. He retired in 2011 after 30 years of service working at uh, Southwest Louisiana uh, Technical Community College in technical education and workforce development. So I think our community college people here can take note of that in particular. Uh, RB currently holds the position of Vice President of Business and Workforce Development for the Southwest Louisiana Economic Development Alliance. He focuses, his focuses include recruiting, retraining, and expanding businesses, and facilitating better communication between the business and education communities of Southwest Louisiana to identify needs and resources for building 21st century world-class workforce in the region. He holds degrees from McNeese State University and Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He's active in religious, professional, civic, and fraternal organizations in his spare time, I don't know what that would be, but if he has some spare time, he enjoys traveling with his wife, Stephanie, and uh, children, Robert and Emily. Let's welcome R.B. Smith. Dennis, I asked, Dennis, thank you for inviting me. You may get run out of town, but that's all right. Why are we here? You know, I have to ask that question. Why are we here? There was a man and his son were sitting on the bank of a river one day, and they were a beautiful day like this. And a little eight-year-old son looked up and said, Daddy, why are we here? And the man pondered for a little while. He said, well, we're sitting here on this lush green grass looking out over the beautiful blue sky with the, the warm sunshine and the gentle breeze flowing through the leaves of the trees and rippling across the waters of the river. And we strive to do well in our life, to make good grades and go to good schools and get great educations and go out and start great careers. Marry well and have families. Give back to our community. To where when we come to the end of life's toilsome journey, we can look back and say, we made this world better than where we found it. Son, does that answer your question? No, Daddy, it doesn't. Well, why doesn't it answer your question, son? So I asked why we're here, because Mama said to pick her up 45 minutes ago. <laughs> Not the same joke I told you, Lance, but that's all right. Okay, here's our agenda. This is what they told me to talk about, but if I get off topic, y'all just wave at me and say, hey, I didn't get the middle section. Y'all here, too? Y'all wave at me and say, hey. All right, good, because y'all going to participate in this. You're not going to sit back and go to sleep. Secondary and tertiary businesses, what can they expect from this big movement? You know, how can small businesses benefit from an ethane cracker coming to your community? Is this a good time to launch a new business and be entrepreneurial? And then I'll add to this last one for you, Dennis, because this is the one you wanted. It says, how can the chamber develop an effective B2B network? Okay, off and running. Mario, don't go to sleep on me. <laughs> Here we go. Here's your game changer. We have a game changer. Everybody's got a game changer. Pennsylvania Chemicals has a world scale. And look, Chet did a great job. I'm, I'm telling you, Chet's got so much experience. I hate to come after him because it makes me look so dumb. I can't spell IOT and here he is talking about it. 
6,000 construction workers, 600 permanent jobs, $6 billion project. Six, 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 no, we may not go there, keep going. <laughs> Here's, what's, here's what happened. Shell announced the project. Did y'all hear the announcement? <laughs> it's wonderful. We're glad for you. You got it. Six billion dollar ethane cracker. This is a huge investment in Monaco. That's you. Let me tell you something, friend. Have you ever seen a 340 foot wash tower being lifted? Now you gotta see that. I'll bring the film on that next time. 340 foot tower, they lift it in one lift nowadays. They use a huge ring crate. But it's, it's a beautiful thing. That's going, to be your, that's going to be your central focus point there. Bechtel, they're the main contractor for this. Bechtel is the largest domestic civil engineering and, and industrial construction firm in the, United, in the United States today. Their office is in San Francisco, California, where we built a nice bridge. And now they can go across the bay because y'all built the bridge for them. So not, but Bechtel's coming to town. And they've got experience building these kinds of projects. And there's only about five or six of the EPCs in the world that can handle a billion dollar mega project. You got a good one. Bechtel's a good firm. And I already talked about these. They're one of the few, but here we go. Their experience is they've, they've built on all seven continents. Can you imagine having to build something in Antarctica? It's tough. You can't, you can't bring in fresh milk, it comes in as ice cream. One of, the, one of the issues you have when you're dealing with one of the world's largest contractors is they know the world. They've already got their friendships built. They already have their supply lines figured out. They know that because, uh, and these gentlemen here are lawyers, but lawyers and accountants run the job. They say, you gotta be safe and you gotta be cheap. I mean, y'all worry about the, because we don't want lawsuits and we want everybody to be safe because today's safety is a very important part of what you do and we've got to make sure that whatever supply lines we have we're going to be able to depend on them and we can depend on them at a certain price so every subcontractor that comes into a project has to have that documented record of safety and if you see that experience modification rate that emr you have to have 100,000 man hours per year in most cases to qualify. 100,000 man hours. Now I know most of y'all are workaholics because if you're a baby boomer like I am, you work all the time, but you're not gonna get 100,000 man hours by yourself. So don't think if you got a pickup truck and an extension ladder and a paint brush, you're gonna go inside the plant and paint. You're gonna have to do something different. This is, this is why we're gonna help you with small businesses. But this is, what, this is what, why you don't always get the work inside the plant. But there's going to be work available for you. Here's, where, here's what happens right now. Years before they made that announcement, they started with working with their partner, Bechtel, and they started lining up fabrication shops all over the world. And I mean all over the world, even in Louisiana, we got some of your work, believe it or not, but all over the world, they're building component parts for your plant in Western Pennsylvania. And they'll bring it in. A lot of it will come by sea to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, off of a deep water vessel and load it on a barge and come up the Mississippi River, up the Ohio River and dock right in front of your plant and they'll use heavy haul equipment to bring it up the hill and set it on the plant site. Now, when Sarita was talking about lease equipment, guess what your number one lease piece of equipment is in an industrial site? Cranes. Chet, you cheated, you knew. It's cranes. You're gonna be able to pass that job site before long and you see all those cranes standing up and if you were leasing those cranes, oh yeah, you could vacation in the Caribbean. Oh, that's good. So that's what we need. So, this, so those are some things. So most local companies, they, just, they don't have the relationships that they need to go directly to the mega projects. They don't have 
any connection with Bechtel that, that's well established. And uh, we need to make sure that you understand what it takes if you're interested in going in there to, to get to source some goods in. One of the things that every company does that's in that qualification, they have their own set of guidelines that their lawyers and accountants have set up for them. So Bechtel has online this manual that helps you. You go online to their website, you can get it, and it's a very detailed manual, and it tells you how to go through and online enter all the information they require to enter you as a vendor into their procurement process. Doesn't mean you get a call, but one thing about it is if you don't follow that process, you guarantee you won't get a call. So take your time, look at it and see. But remember that EMR, if you don't have, if you can't work with your risk management folks and, and show where you got an EMR less than one, then you've got to sit back and you've got to look at how you can take your business, if you want to work inside the facility, and work with other contractors as a subcontractor, as a, as a secondary, a tertiary, a quaternary, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, whatever down the line you want to be a subcontractor to Bechtel on the plant site. Those are the kind of strategies you've got to work on today. Because as they're, as they're building the plant all over the world and they bring it in here, they do that to where they don't have to have the number of people in and out of the plant to stick build it, to bring all the materials and try to fit it all up on the job site. It's already fit and they just put it together uh, kind of like Legos. They just stack it up and let it go. So you get the manual, download it. If you're interested in selling to Bechtel, this is something you need to do. And even if you want to be a supplier, if you want to provide consumer supplies, you still need to be in their procurement system. Now, one of the things that we learned, here's some, some things that we found were kind of locally sourced goods that Sarita talked about earlier and some of the ethane crackers at home. And I'll just show you there's some construction stuff, some structural things. Trucking is a big part of it. Uh, a lot of civil work. I think you're doing civil work on the site now, hauling dirt and doing aggregate. I believe that's where we are with the things. But fences, railroads, building all that stuff. Concrete, millions of yards of concrete using these things. Paving, that kind of stuff. Architectural work. And yes, some architects get involved because Bechtel, that's, they generally outsource that to the local folks if they get a chance. But to, to sit down and draw up the buildings like the office buildings and some of the control rooms, that sort of thing. But all the different equipment that goes into where you're going to have people, that's going to be some of the things that they do locally as well. Fire systems and that sort of thing. Um, and this is something to go along with what Chet talked about. You know, all the controls that they put in there, sometimes they need some of the, some of the folks locally to provide some valves or some uh, fitting some hardware items, that sort of thing. Electrical work, there's miles and miles of wire, miles and miles of cable, miles and miles of fiber optic, because we're dealing so much nowadays with the Internet of Things. Everything has an Internet address. Tagged instruments. Now, I'll let Chet talk to you about that. That's one of his areas. But all the different instruments that we're using to do the measure, the processes, the levels, the temperatures, the flows, uh, and do all the analytical work that we have on things like emissions to make sure that you, you, you have everything recorded to show the government should there ever be any question. Industrial paint and insulation, one of the things we do when we bring uh, those segmented pieces, those modular pieces into the plant, a, a big column that's 340 foot high, you have to scaffold up if you stick build it, but if you lay it on the ground, you can get there and paint it and insulate it and it's just all you do is you stand it up in place. It's, it works really well. Also, when you got 6,000 people out there, there's something nice every now and then they like to eat. So catering is a good thing. So having, having those kinds of things available close by on the job site helps. And then, of course, the office equipment and supplies. Now, one of the other things, once Shell's here, they're going to be your neighbor for a long, long time. But Shell, like Bechtel, is a global company and they don't just 
you know, they don't use the yellow pages to pick out who they buy from. They have a procurement procedure. So if you go on Shell's website, you can get this manual, and many of you may be interested in doing this, and we would encourage you to do that. But they're going to have requirements that you show that you, that you are a business that they can vet to make sure that you can be part of their supply line. They have to be able to know that their suppliers are going to be able to supply them just in time the things they want at a competitive price. So those are things that you need to do. Multinational country, I don't know how many countries uh, Shell is in, but just about all of them, I'm sure, by now. Uh, but they've got a lot going on, and if they've got, what would you say, 5,000 different business applications just in your IT. So if you're in the IT business, just being able to unravel some of that would be good. So that's, that's some good ideas to, as where you might find some potential opportunities for your business. But fill out, go online and fill out the application with Shell if you want to do business with them directly. That way you're set up in their procurement business as well. Um, some of the local uh, contractors want to work together. I think that uh, consortiums, joint ventures, those types of things work in our area. Hopefully they'll work in your area. Again, building up your financial uh, ability, building up your safety record, building up your insurance abilities, your bonding of capabilities, those type of things are very important to the big corporations when they're dealing with contractors. Today, time's more valuable than money. That's why people do Amazon, because they pay $100 for Amazon Prime every year, and in two days, they got their stuff sitting at the doorstep. I see a little lady saying, amen, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Don't order it on the 24th of December, you won't have any Christmas presents, so. But anyhow, so that's, that's what it is. Most people, their time is worth more than their, than their money. They've got too much, you know, too much they want to do in their life that doesn't include that. So they shop online, they get home delivery. Okay, so the question is, is it a good time to start a business now? I mean, that depends. It really depends on a lot of things. Entrepreneurship's what built our country. Even though we got this huge business coming, going to invest $6 billion in our community, employ 600 of our neighbors to work here, you folks that are members of the local chamber of commerce and your small businesses still represent the largest employers in the area because small businesses employ more than the big businesses do. So we want entrepreneurs to keep going. We want them to come with their business ideas, but one of the problems that we find is a lot of people are good at what they do, but they're not good at business. So what we did, and this is available to you online through our website at the alliance, swla.org, for no price, no fee, not copyrighted. You can take and print what you want off of it. This is our small business resource guide, and it carries you through how to set up a business. And if you've got someone that wants to start a business, we would suggest that they spend a little time, download the guide, and read through it. Because if you don't have the business expertise, we want you to go out there, and we want you to go full blast and fail fast. No point in just bleeding it on out, just going full blast and fail fast and get on back to what you were doing before or read the guide and hopefully you can make it survive. So we offer that to you as a, as a, as a free service that we develop as part of bringing our entrepreneurs in our area into the fold and helping them go into small business. And that's what built America. Now, we have a small business incubator in southwest Louisiana that's located at our seed center, which that's our building for the, the Alliance, which is located on the McNeese State University campus. We may well be the only uh, chamber of commerce with offices on the university campus, but we require that every business that wants to come in our business incubator develop a business plan. And the business plan is not just a, a sheet of paper, so I want to open a pizza parlor, here's my plan. Because Mr. Banker's sitting right here, he wants to look at your finances and how you plan to make money. Or oh, he's not going to loan him any money. What's that, subprime? What's the level below that? That's where my credit is. <laughs> well, anyhow, this 
So, you know, a business plan is that you sit down and you know what you're going to do well enough that you're going to look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, your threats. You're going to give a good analysis of who's my competition and why would anybody want to buy my product? Why would anyone want to engage my service? And will it work in this market or not? And if you can, if you can get it worked out and show how it works, and you go see your friendly banker here, he's got plenty of money to loan the ones that got a good business plan. But we want to make sure that when they come in the incubator, they have the business plan and we help them get it going. Because if you fail to plan, then what happens? I'll wait. You can plan to fail. Who said that? Uh, get get uh, Dennis to buy you lunch. That'd be great. Here we go. Y'all got Uber? Y'all know about Uber, right? What's Uber do? You got an app on your phone. I'm at the airport last night. Hit Uber. Young lady comes, picks me up, brings me to Monaco. It's a wonderful thing. Got nothing to worry about. You got a little snacks, a bottle of water. It's good. Waiter. That's all our answer to Uber. Waiter brings the food to you. You don't have to go to the restaurant and pick up your food. If you're working at your desk and you decide, well, I, I sure would like to go to the restaurant across town, but time I get over and get back, be too rushed and all that stuff, you can go and hit the waiter app. And what happens is they send, that sends electronically a ticket. It's the Internet of Things chat. This is where it works for food, right? Sends a ticket into the expediter at the restaurant. They fix your stuff in a nice little go box. The driver runs by there, picks it up, brings it to your office, and delivers it for a $5 fee, plus a tip for the driver. But if you've, got a, if you've got this service right here, we started with just a concept at one of our business pitch uh, seminars about four years ago. 2004, three years, three years ago, 2014. This year, last year they grossed over $10 million. This year we think they're going to gross over $25 million. That's a pretty good American success story right there. And they hire drivers, you know, anybody can drive if they've got a good reliable transportation, they've got the required insurance, and they've got a good driving record, they can pick up a lot of extra money. That's just like, it's Uber for food. So. We, we've got all kinds of new things. So this is what, yeah, 2016 was gross sales of $10 million. So that's pretty good. Not bad for a small, uh, small town folks. They've got, a, what, 500 regular employees, 1,000 contractors at the last count, and I think he's up from that. So we'll have to check with Chris and see. Now, here's the B2B thing that we want to touch on for you. Uh, what we learned is working with these major companies, they're very busy. We're all busy. They, they really can't see however many businesses are sitting in this room by appointment in their office. They just can't do it. But what we try to do is we tried to get with those businesses and set up sessions with their procurement people to where we could get all our small businesses that were interested trained in that registration procedure that's online. What you need, they'll come in and explain to you. This is what you need in the way of insurance. This is what you need in the way of financial backing. This is what you need in the way of business volume to do business with us. Go in and fill out that online and give them a couple of weeks to go do it. Gather up what they need. They work on their own. In a couple of weeks, everybody that's filled it out will know who they are. Invite them back, and then they get to meet with the procurement people, make that one-on-one -on -one relationship right there. They touch base with them right there. And so that's what happens. We train them. We explain to them how it works. We bring it together. Small businesses get a chance to meet with the big guys. And if you're doing you know, if you're doing those kind of supportive things that don't require that you go inside the fence, it's a lot less stringent. In other words, if you can drop stuff off at the warehouse to these plants, you don't have to have all those high rates of insurance and all that safety rating. You just got to have your business in good order. So hopefully, and, and you know, if you ship it in, 
You know, if you never have to go out and see the plant per se, that works too. But you, if you want to be in the supply line, if you want to be a, a contractor on some of the uh, office supplies or, or uh, any of those types of things, ice and water, there's a whole bunch of that that goes on in the construction process. So there's all kinds of ways that you can make money for this, but you need to make sure that you're hooked up with their right uh, procurement procedure and process. Uh, we keep working, this is, this is all outlining. This will be on the slides when you get the, uh, the PowerPoint at the end of the session. I think Dennis is gonna send them out to everybody or they can get them off the website. Or, or Jack was, I think Jack committed to that. Where'd Jack go? <laughs> Everything will be on the website, okay, good. One of the things we did in Louisiana we wanted to make sure that we could also connect with the small businesses to the EPCs and the, and the major vendors through a website that we developed through Louisiana Economic Development. And what it does is it, it connects the small business to the EPCs that may not have, we may not have them there yet, but we're, we're hoping that we'll get them but this is a way that we can vet them ahead of time, have them out there, and the major businesses can go online and see it. It's called the Louisiana uh, Business Connection dot com. Job, let's see, I got the job connection up here. I got the wrong one, but anyhow, I get the right I get the right connection on it. But Louisiana Job Connection dot com for the for the jobs, but Louisiana Business Connection dot com is for the businesses. You go online. You fill out all the required forms on the online form, and then it's set into a database that you're a vetted and recognized business. So as the EPCs and as the chemical plants uh, look around and look for local content, this is a way that we're able to also help work in networks to where your business is working 24 hours a day for you online. So that's another, another service we do. This is what the... Uh, what the website looks like for the business connection, how you go on and register and get your business set up right here. Uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite quotes from one of the great industrialists of the former century was Thomas, Thomas Edison. He said, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed up in overalls and looks like work. So that's my friends, that's what, it, that's what you've got in front of you, you've got a lot of work if you wanna work with these big businesses. Now I see, uh, I see Jack looking at his watch. That's the last slide, Jack. You don't have to worry. 